tumpaka Ijumaa moja kwa moja kutoka POS Swahili Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yuat. It's Tuesday, January 10th. This is Africa 54. Uganda court has taken some of the teeth out of a communications law used to hammer journalists and government critics, as VOA's Paul Nadiho details. VOA's Straight Talk Africa host Haiti Adams and International Trade Center Chief Pamela Coke Hamilton talk about women's entrepreneurship advancement on the continent. Africa wants to produce vaccines on the continent as VOA's Lenore Madu discusses with Tony Blair Institute's Dr. Avere Okareki. All this and much more on today's Africa 54. We begin in East Africa, where a Ugandan court has quashed a section of a communications law used to prosecute government critics, journalists and writers, including two who fled to exile in Germany. Paul Ndiho has more. Critics of the government in Uganda face intimidation and violence on a nearly daily basis. On Tuesday, a court in Uganda quashed a section of a communications law that has been used to prosecute government critics. Under Uganda's Computer Misuse Act, one of the sections prohibits the use of electronic communication to disturb the peace, quiet, or right of privacy of any person with no purpose of legitimate communication. Uganda also prides itself as a nation that has liberalized the media. It has more than 200 radio stations, over 30 independent television stations, private and government-owned newspapers operating in the country. However, Ugandan authors and journalists are often targeted under the Computer Misuse Act. And punishment for offenders can range from steep cash penalties to jail sentences of several years. In a ruling on a petition filed by rights activists seeking the quashing, of that section of the law. The Constitutional Court agreed, saying it violated the Constitution. A Constitutional Court judge, Kenneth Kakuru, says the law is unjustifiable as it curtails the freedom of speech in a free and democratic society. He declared the law null and void and banned its enforcement. Rights activists have long complained about Uganda's communication laws enacted by the government of President Yoweri Museveni, and that they are mainly used to punish opponents of President Yoweri Museveni, who has ruled the East African nation since 1986. Stella Nyanzi, a former Makere University lecturer and author who attracted a substantial social media following, for her profanity and vulgarity last critical attacks on Umseveni, spent more than a year in jail after she was convicted under Uganda's electronic communication laws. She subsequently fled to Germany, where she now lives in exile alongside another Ugandan author and international award winner, Tokwenza Ruchirabashija who was prosecuted under the same law before he also fled the country. Kakwenza is the 2021 Pen Painter Prize winner for an international writer of courage, which is presented annually to a writer who has been persecuted for speaking about their beliefs. Last February, according to his lawyer, the novelist fled to Germany out of fear for his life after being tortured. In principle, the Constitution of Uganda guarantees freedom of the press. Still, in practice, the media are hindered by laws including those on fraudulent digital activity and terrorism and public order. 
In 2021, the Constitutional Court rejected appeals by journalist associations. As a result, journalists face many obstacles and pressure for self-censorship when they seek information of public interest. Paul Ndiho, VOA News, Washington. South Africa's power giant ESCOM says police are investigating an alleged attempt to poison the state utility's outgoing CEO. David Doyle has more. Police are investigating whether an attempt was made to poison South African power utility ESCOM's outgoing chief executive, Andre de Reuter. That's according to the state-owned company and a government minister on Sunday. ESCOM's head of security said in a statement that it could not comment further on the alleged cyanide poisoning incident, which took place in December. Public Enterprises Minister Pravin Gordon said there would be a thorough investigation and anyone found to be responsible would be charged. Without giving details, Gordon said an intense battle was taking place between those who want South Africa to work and thrive and those who want to corruptly enrich themselves. De Reuter officially took office in January 2020, leading a company-wide clampdown on corruption and organized criminal behavior, including the sabotage of power plants. But on December 14th, under political pressure, he resigned. He had failed to solve a crisis at ESCOM that has led to record power cuts in South Africa. De Reuter could not be reached for comment. ESCOM's board chairman, Mpo Mukwana, was also unavailable. South African police did not immediately respond to a request for comment. That was David Doe of Reuters reporting. 46 soldiers are back home in Ivory Coast after having been detained in Mali for six months amid political tensions. Their release signals an apparent resolution of di a diplomatic standoff between the West African neighbors that also worsened Mali's already tense relations with regional powers. Citing a commitment to peace and dialogue, Mali's military junta late Friday pardoned the soldiers who had been sentenced on December 30th to 20 years in prison for allegedly attempting to undermine state security. The troops were arrested in July at the airport in Bamako. At the time, the Malian authorities say the troops were acting as mercenaries, but Ivory Coast officials say they were part of a United Nations peacekeeping mission in Mali. For more insights into the soldiers' detention in Mali, I'm joined live via Skype from Omaha, Nebraska by Darcie Di Bindute, a political analyst for Western Africa. Mr. Bindute, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. What could possibly have led the Malian authorities to say these soldiers were mercenaries and therefore detained them for six months? Thank you. Uh, you know, um, the President Thomas Sankara said, when an African fights a gun, a weapon is not again an European, an American, or an uh, Asian. It's against uh, Africa. This is what happened between Mali and uh, Ivory Coast. <clears throat> you know, the, the conflict in Mali is not a ethnic or uh, area country. It's a colonialist, uh, colonial con uh, conflict. So what uh, the president of Ivory Coast wanted to do, it was to destroy uh, Mali. Uh, this is what happened between Burkina Faso and uh, Ivory Coast when the president Laurent Babo was uh, ruling the country. So, uh, but, uh, uh, Mr. Bedute, we understand that they were there as part of a peacekeeping mission in neighboring Mali and not mercenaries. That was the mission they went to fight and uh, kind of stabilize the region. So what impact anyway does this have on these soldiers who went out there thinking they're going to be part of a peacekeeping mission but ended up being detained and also for their families back in Ivory Coast? Yeah, uh, we can say it. the official, uh, what they say, it's not what they wanted to do. Because it was uh, um, um, this uh, mission, they couldn't have this problem. But today, we know what was going on. So now the families are happy because their son, their husband, 
the brown days, there and back home. But the relationship between Mali and Ivory Coast is still uh, in the same way because we don't know what the president Ouattara will do for Mali because they say they have uh, they have uh, secret uh, document and we don't know now what Ivory Coast must do. But for now, it's uh, good for West Africa because it was a serious political situation. And um, any countries was, uh, uh, nobody was supporting Mali because people think that Mali uh, was accusing Ivory Coast for mercenary. But the reality today, we know what was going on. And I think it's a good uh, resolution for everybody in West Africa because it was uh, a scary situation. Bendute, thank you very much uh, for your insight. Darcia Bendute is a political analyst for West Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, right. Sub-Saharan Africa has the world's highest rate of women entrepreneurship according to the 2021 MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurs. But studies also show that women face widespread discrimination in business and battle to access the financing they need to grow their enterprises. Pamela Coke Hamilton is the executive director of the International Trade Center. She says while these barriers need to be eliminated, there are ways women can succeed and benefit from new business and trade opportunities on the continent. She spoke to Hedy Adams, host of VOA's Trade Talk Africa here in Washington. Pamela, what are the greatest advantages that women business owners or entrepreneurs in emerging markets have mm -hmm. at the moment? And similarly, what disadvantages or barriers mm -hmm. do they face that you believe need to be addressed and eliminated urgently? Thanks so much, Heidi. The first advantage I would say, and this has occurred actually on turbocharge in the digital world, COVID has literally transformed how trade happens. It's almost tripled the amount of digital trade. So digitalization actually is now the greatest advantage that women traders have. One, because it's online and therefore it lowers their costs. Their overhead costs, costs for physical space, for storage, they can literally operate from anywhere. On the disadvantage side globally, what we found is one, access to finance. It is a recurring theme and it's something that we have to address. So what we do is we try to work with women to help them access finance, to put in place the kinds of mechanisms. One thing we found is most collateral that's requested is 125% of their business. 125%. Nobody can afford that. The second thing is that they also are unable to meet some of the requirements for paperwork because so many of them are informal and they're small and they're not in the industries that require that kind of paperwork. So we want to try to also see how we can work with them to build up their capacity to get financing. What is your advice to women about what they can do in their mm -hmm. businesses to increase their chances of yeah. gaining access, access to finance and investment? And here I mean advice that women can immediately yes. apply to like their right work. now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so let me just give you a, a kind of outline of what we've done in the area of access to finance. Just uh, in 2019, we launched a She Trades Invest Care Fund with Bamboo Capital. And the idea was how do we link um, the, the, the lack of access to finance to capital um, providers and, and kind of create a space where women can get access to whether it's venture capital or other forms of capital. We also work with women to prepare them to make the pitch because most don't have that, right. you know what I mean? So we, we work with them through this to help them make it. And then we also work with financial institutions on the other side to also help them to become more gender you know, balanced. Yes, right. because there are things that you know, most financial institutions have a traditional approach. Bring the collateral, bring the piece of paper with the land. Most women are not on that piece of paper, you know, and this is a reality. So what we try to do is also work with the banking institutions to say, look, how do you facilitate a gender lens approach to what you do? So for women, the advice I'd give is the first thing, focus on the basics. Get your paperwork together. 
if you're going to go to people to ask them to invest, you kind of have to have a good argument. The other thing is to ensure that you are able to engage with partners and with organizations that can help you. So reach out, you know, whether it's to your own business support organization, whether it's to us um, through the She Trade Invest program, it's online. You can go on shetrades.com, you will find all of that. Um, and, and just ensure that you understand that there's opening there, there are people looking out for you, and that there's opportunity. That was Pamela Cook Hamilton from the International Trade Center speaking with VOA's Heidi Adams. Be sure to catch the full interview on this week's episode of Straight Talk Africa. Tell us what you think about Africa 54 and all our VOA Africa programs on our website at voaafrica.com. Still to come, less than 1% of vaccines used in Africa are manufactured on the continent. We'll have a report. But first, Heidi Adams tells us what's coming up on Wednesday's Straight Talk Africa. On the next Straight Talk Africa, we'll take a look at Ethiopia's future and the prospect for lasting peace. Also, my conversation with the Executive Director of the International Trade Center, Pamela Coke Hamilton, about how the African continental free trade area can unlock global and local opportunities for women-owned businesses. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. You're watching Africa 54 from the Voice of America here in Washington. In other news, talks are ongoing in Khartoum between the Sudanese political parties as they try to reach a final deal to form a civilian government and resolve other outstanding issues more than one year after a military coup. Suspected warlord Gabriel Masakwa appeared Tuesday in a Finnish appeals court. He is accused of atrocities in Liberia's civil war following his acquittal last year in a lower court. Masakwa was moved to Finland in 2008 and is accused of murders, rapes and war crimes. And Kenya Airways says it is experiencing flight disruptions due to delays in securing aircraft components required for maintenance. Chief Executive Officer Alan Kilavuka says, quote, the challenges have been occasioned by the Ukraine war crisis, which has significantly crippled the Russian supply chain crucial to global aviation. National security forces have intervened to restore order in Brazil after an estimated 4,000 supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro, who do not accept the results of the October elections, took over and vandalized the Congress, the Supreme Court and President's Palace in the capital, Brasilia. Edgar Maciel in Sao Paulo reports. During Brazil's first day of the year, a crowd in the streets of Brasilia came out to see Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva inaugurated as the country's new president. One week later, crowds witnessed a different scene on the same street and attempted coup. An estimated 4,000 supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro invaded the Congress building, the Supreme Court, and Planalto Palace, the president's official workplace. The few police officers who were supposed to provide security were chased away. Rioters smashed windows, overturned furniture, and broke into historic buildings. The anti-Lula demonstrators filmed the destruction as it unfolded while attacking the president's residence, invading the Senate, breaking works of art, and setting fire to the Chamber of Deputies. The main entrance of Brazil's Supreme Court building was destroyed. Hundreds of rioters were arrested, but only after President Lula signed a decree for federal forces to intervene. Video posted on social media show police officers walking and driving around the line of demonstrators towards the attack site. Here, police appear to be standing by after a large crowd of rioters entered the buildings. President Lula, who was not in Brasilia at the time, set up a crisis committee and said he will investigate and arrest those involved. They are fascists representing everything abominable. They are true vandals who destroyed everything they found in front of them. All the people who did this will be found and punished. Democracy guarantees the right to freedom, but it also demands that people respect the institutions. Bolsonaro, who has been in the U.S. state of Florida since he left power, distanced himself from the attacks on social media. He wrote, peaceful demonstrations as allowed by law are part of democracy. However, attacks on and invasions of public buildings as occurred today, as well as those practiced by the left in 2013 
and 2017 defy the rule of law. Bolsonaro said the government has linked him to the riots without evidence. Commentators say the former president could come under investigation. Jair Messias Bolsonaro is one of those responsible for this attack. He is seen as an intellectual mentor because dozens of times he suggested this type of action during his tenure, not to mention the silence, not admitting defeat after the elections. It fueled in its supporters a feeling that the coup was possible. National police forces and the Brazilian army have assumed command of Brasilia's security until the end of the month. The Brazilian Congress, which was in recess, called an emergency meeting on Monday. For Edgar Marcial, Miguel Amaya, VOA News. It's time for Health Report, and joining us now is our Africa 54 health correspondent, Lino Mudu, with the latest on. Tell us what's happening. Children's children, yes, children health, and uh, unfortunately, looking at mortality. Hello, Esther. Hello, everyone. According to a new United Nations report, an estimated 5 million children died before their fifth birthday, and another 2 million children and youth uh, between 5 and 24 lost their lives in 2021. According to the latest data released by the UN Interagency Group, for child mortality estimation. In a separate report also released Monday, the group found that nearly 2 million babies were stillborn during the same period. Tragically, many of these deaths could have been prevented with equitable access and high-quality maternal newborn, adolescent and child health care. Children born in sub-Saharan Africa are subject to the highest risk of childhood death in the world, 15 times higher than the risk for children in Europe and Northern America. The World Health Organization says that less than 1% of vaccines used in Africa are manufactured on the continent. The continent, along with many developing nations, depend on developed nations to obtain life-saving vaccines. The African Union aims for the region to develop, produce and supply more than 60% of the vaccine doses required on the continent by 2040. It's an ambitious target that observers say requires bold investment, the need for highly trained, skilled labor, intense quality assurance and control, and political will. For more perspective, I spoke with Dr. Ebere Okereke, technical advisor at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. In Africa, um, we have always had a challenge with vaccine preventable diseases that our, our health systems haven't been good enough to ensure that everybody who is eligible for vaccination gets those. So we have had annual in outbreaks of cholera, for example, in the seasons, um, and our uptake of our coverage for measles has never quite reached that threshold where we interrupt and prevent outbreaks. However, in the last two years, as a consequence of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the pressure that has put on the very fragile health system we've had, routine immunizations for children, such as measles vaccinations, have dropped. And it just goes to show how important it is that we maintain health systems that are resilient and able to deal with the pressures of an outbreak while maintaining routine services such as childhood immunization. How does Africa fare in terms of access to those vaccines? Our health system's capacity to deliver vaccines routinely is not optimal. Um, we have underinvestment in our health systems and we are often reliant on donors to fund essential public health programs, including childhood immunization. Secondly, is the fact that we don't actually manufacture a significant amount of the pro pharmaceutical products that we need. It's predominantly because we haven't invested in the system. We haven't created an environment that is attractive for uh, manufacturing to occur on the continent. There has been a, a lack of commit, uh, a political will and financial investment in the, in the ecosystem. We know we have a population of 1.4 billion, billion on the continent, so there's a potential market, but we haven't actually created the demand. There are vaccines that are actually licensed and exist at the moment, which we don't currently 
use across the continent in our routine immunizations. Take, for example, hepatitis B vaccines. Those vaccines exist, but we're not using them. So it's a complex issue. And then, of course, the final challenge is actually getting vaccines from the port into people's arms. How do we uh, make sure that Africa is prepared for the next mm. crisis? So we need to see to have the global ecosystem recognize the challenges and that the challenges experienced by Africa are global challenges. We have to grow our own research and development capacity. Currently, we, our governments collectively on the continent invest less than 1% in research into pharmaceutical products, 1% of their, of, their, of, their, of their GDPs. We need to create an enabling environment for international um, companies to partner with African manufacturers to manufacture here. Um, to do that, we need to understand the size of the market. We need to understand, make sure that there's funding available. We need to in ensure that the manufacturing sits alongside the research and development and the people, the talent, the workforce that need to work in those industries. And then we also need to create the demand. National countries have to identify what the burdens are in their countries, set strategies to ensure that vaccines that get to their, their shores can be delivered to the people who need them. And to do that collectively, we as citizens of the continent and the 55 countries that are part of the Africa Union need to hold our governments to account. We need to actually remind them that health is not a drain on resources. Health is an investment. Dr. Iberi, what is the best case scenario in terms of vac vaccine manufacturing on the continent? Uh, is it a manufacturing plant in each region, in each country? What are we talking about? What we need is manufacturing that's tailored to the continental needs, that creates enough capacity to serve our needs and provide some re resilience and, and wiggle room. So what we've done through the Partnership of Africa Vaccine Manufacturing is to develop a continental strategy, which identifies which vaccines we want to see manufactured on the continent, what sort of, sort of technology we should like to see, aiming for a spread, a diversity of technology so that we have resilience in the system, and also looking at uh, different parts along the value chain, whether we're starting from the research and development all the way to just the fill and finish and packaging. We need to ensure that we have enough diversity to provide that resilience, but not so much that it becomes um, financially unviable. You are the technical advisor at the Tech Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. When we talk about global change, what do we talk about? It's about equity. It's about creating a world where the resources that are available are equitably accessible to everybody. But what the Tony Blair Institute does, not just in the health space, is work with governments to improve their ability to deliver to their citizens, to improve their economy, their development, their health, so that they have more equitable access to the, to the global pie. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Linor Moudou. Esther? Thank you so much, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Moudou's health report right here every Tuesday on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching. <laughs>